Hello. Good evening to you. Delighted to come to you again this evening on our James study. And it is possible today we will finish our study of James together. And it just seems like just a few weeks ago, just a short time ago, we began our study. Now we're wrapping up this book. And I'm thinking through what options we have for future future Bible studies coming. So Weekly Wisdom will continue next week, but maybe from another book. So we'll pass that along to you. So let's pray again today as we open. Lord, I thank you for this book of James and ask you that you would help us to study and learn and grow. We're so grateful for what we've learned from the book of James, what we can put into our lives, that you are a God who calls us through the midst of suffering to grow, learn, become and do all the things that you command us to do. So thank you for this privilege and we ask that we would be faithful to you through the power of your spirit in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I think the verse 12 of the last chapter, chapter five, I'm going to begin with, I, I think, believe it or not, I can't really remember if we even touched on this. I know we finished last week the idea that we're walking on the path of God and we're looking at what indeed God has for us. We do it humbly as we draw near to him. We do it with humility and the fact that we don't know all the details of life, but we do know indeed who the one is that holds our path of life. And so we, we say, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills, we will do this and that. So we're very thankful for these opportunities. But verse 12 begins, this is, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. This seems a little bit like wrapping around from the first chapter. Our, our words should be not full of anger. Our tongue in chapter 3 is to be that which blesses God and blesses other people. We're walking in humility in chapter 4, and here we're waiting patiently for the Lord to come. And so it seems if we look at this in the context of the whole book that James is saying to us that there's a temptation to make vows, to make religious or personal vows before God in order to raise our status with him or to bring credibility or control to the moment in which we live in. Think about that for a minute. Think about it. when you want to make a promise to someone. Hey, I really am I'm telling you the truth. I've really done this. Sometimes we're doing it to impress, and a person looks at us and says, I wonder if you're telling me the truth. No, I promise. I swear on my mother's grave. I swear by my good name. I swear by, and they add an oath of some sort. Uh, the Bible says be careful with this. Be careful with these kinds of oaths. Uh, they're, they're really dangerous because they're basically setting up some kind of promise that's built upon something other than God's good character in us. And their vows are easily made. They're easily made to impress other people. That's the status part. It's easy to, to win over people. I promise I'm going to do something, even though we may not. It may be also a way of trying to control the future. I promise that I will give you a return on this investment or I will deliver this in this way. And again, we're, we're not living in the kind of humility. So as a result, our good character in God should be what we settle in. And there's a certain humility that says, yes, if the Lord wills, yes, as I promised you, I will deliver and no. And so this kind of simplicity, this is something I find fascinating in the book of James. There is this in James, a stripped down simplicity that comes with spirituality. So often in the history of the church and in the history of cultures, there is a religiosity that has a lot of flurry and, and fanciness. But no, this is basically saying, much as the Puritans might have said, that your yes be yes, your no be no. Let a humble expression of your promise be enough to secure a relationship, a responsibility. And it shows commitment and dependence upon God. It shows an honoring and a commitment to other people. Uh, it seems a little less flashy, but it actually is filled with much more faith. And what happens then is uh, 
Let your yes be yes, your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. There are so many times where vows are broken. Now, this passage is not is not saying that there, are, there we can't take a vow like a pledge of the allegiance. There's a proper allegiance given to our country, again, under God. There's a proper oath of allegiance to our spouses, let's say in a marital vow. No, but it's suggesting that we shouldn't use religious or business vows as a way to go beyond the character and the commitments that God would have us have in our time together. So this is important stuff for us to, to realize. Again, feeds into the humility aspect that we've been looking at. Verse 13 continues. It says, is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him praise. So let him sing praise. Verse 14, is any among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. What a delightfully practical passage. It's interesting as we come through James. Now we come to some places that that deal with the practical realities of life. The writer of James is saying to the church, is anyone suffering? Start at verse 13. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. It's interesting when you're feeling sick, when you're feeling physically bad, how do you respond? Most of us, I believe, sort of turn within ourselves. Don't you pull in, tuck your knees up, kind of pull the covers up over your head? This passage says that when you're suffering, don't just close it down. Don't just shut it down. Pray. Look to God. There's a powerful, powerful opportunity here. Our sicknesses are opportunities for us to depend and turn to God. I know many times when I've felt a cold coming on, many times when I've started to get sick, there are times where I literally look and I say, Lord, I need you now. I need to lean on you. So I'm going to say a lot more about sickness, but I want to say that one of the ways that God uses suffering difficulty, of course, here, this suffering could be broader than just sickness. It'll be mentioned that way, but suffering could be financial. I think sometimes when we financial suffering, when somebody loses their job, oftentimes we think of it as a chaotic occurrence and we don't immediately turn to God and pray. Sometimes when we have a relational setback, when we have a difficulty with our investments, or with other realities in our life. Sometimes we just simply tuck it in, take it in. We simply turn in, inward. This passage is saying that we should turn outward to God and say, Lord, as we lament, we should pray to you. And this is why the Psalms are filled with lots of, lots of places where the psalmist is talking about suffering. This is why the book of Job, for instance, <laughs> the book of Job is not five chapters long. The book of Job is filled with lengthy discussions and prayers and uh, interactions about suffering. God is telling us. So I just want to mention that and then go on to the next phrase. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Let him sing praise. So here again, when we're suffering, we pray to God. When we're cheerful, we're to praise God. Here again, sometimes when we receive that big bonus at work, when we have a success, when something goes great in our family, when we have a great blessing in our life, it's easy to forget God, to turn away. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells us the danger of all the blessings that God can give us. Uh, Israel was asking God that in some way, and Moses was warning the God's people that when they receive blessing and they become satisfied, they might turn away from God. This passage is saying when we're suffering, Keep looking to God, right? But on the other hand, when we're cheerful, cheerful, we should sing praise to God. Cheerful. So let me unpack that a little more. and Let me go more in depth. It's interesting. The Bible seems to teach us about prayer in the sad times and in the glad times. The sad times we see mentioned in Romans 8, 26 and 27, this amazing verse that says, there are moments when we don't know how to pray. Romans 8, 16 to 25 is this passage that talks about the sufferings of this world. They're just overwhelming. But Paul starts by saying the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's coming. So there's this, this beautiful, this beautiful hope, but the hope isn't always seen. That's what it says. The hope that we have in Christ is not always seen. And so we struggle. 
in our sufferings. And so verse 26 says something that's so comforting. We don't always know how to pray. There are those Christians around us who act as if they always know what to pray for, that they know exactly. I can tell you many times, I don't know what to pray. I've had loved ones, parents and mother-in-law, especially a mother-in-law who was sick with cancer for many, many, many years. And I can remember through the surgeries and through the struggles, 10 years of suffering through colon cancer, then many reoccurrences, then healing, then reoccurrences, then struggles and challenges. And Judy and I were so happy that one day we were having our first child. And we were celebrating the fact that Judy's mother had lived, literally, she lived these years and with such serious disease. She lived and saw her first grandchild, Sarah. She actually took that grandchild upon her lap and, and, and held her. And actually, even for half an hour, babysat her all alone and had her own private special time with her. And we're just so, so amazed by that. And then she fell into sickness again, just a few days later. From the outside, you may have seen it coming, but I, I just didn't. We were so consumed with our child being born. And so all of a sudden, her mom was put back in the hospital, and we were wondering, is she going to recover? And this had happened before, but we were struggling. Do we pray for her to recover? Oh, she would endured so much suffering and pain. And we wanted her as a Christian to go and be healed and, and, and just to know the Lord's presence and finally be over this this long journey of suffering. But we also wanted her to be with this new grandchild and to be with us and celebrate this new life. And so we didn't know how to pray. I can't tell you how many other situations I've had like that as a pastor, where we literally, we don't know how to pray for immediate healing, for strength to endure the affliction. I know the same thing can't, comes true to everyone who has a loved one, who's a parent of a child, who's going through struggles who's going through difficulties, and you wonder, do you pray for the removal of the difficulty, or do you pray for the strength, the tenacity, the grit for the person, that young person especially, to grow so they can overcome the trial or the tribulation? Ah, oh, you don't know how to pray. Romans 8, 26 says we don't know how to pray, and so don't feel badly if there are moments where you don't know how to pray. Say it to God, Lord, I don't know whether I should pray this or that. Then the second part in Romans 8, 26, it says, the Holy Spirit is interceding with you. So this is the great promise we have in suffering and in the midst of our sadness. We're praying to God and we recognize that we don't know how, God does, and the Holy Spirit is interceding with us. And so we have this great, amazing blessing that the Holy Spirit, it says, is interceding for us in this imminent place, this local place called your life and mine. And meanwhile, Jesus is interceding at the right hand of God the Father. So what this means is our Father listens from heaven. The Son is interceding according to his good purpose for our life. The Holy Spirit is whispering and, and praying with us, interceding with us as we groan, it says. And there seems to be some amazing, amazing mystical reality here that perhaps even the Holy Spirit is groaning with us. How, how touching is that? that God himself looks forward to the hope realized in our lives, ultimately in Christ's return, where after we've followed his disciples faithfully in the valley of sorrow, we shall one day taste the joy and the glory of all things being made new. What a powerful, powerful thing that is. And that's why Romans 8, 26 and 27 give way to Romans 28 that says, and we know in all things God works together for good. We also put all of these things in his hands, his providence, so we suffer and we pray and we are cheerful and we praise. Again, I mentioned this is, this is again, is an outward facing faith. We're turning toward God and we're celebrating that the fact that God is in our midst and we thank him for the good gifts, just as James chapter one suggests, and we keep focused on him. But I think there's something more here. Cheerfulness, when it leads to praise, allows the gifts of God to sink in. I have, I have this phrase based in the gospel and also in the, in the book of Joshua that I use all the time with me. And it's the thing that it says this, when we say it out loud, it sinks in. And this is true of grief and lament. When we say in Joshua 1, Moses is dead. 
The people of God had known that for many days, but when Joshua stands before them and says, Moses is dead, the lament allows the truth of that loss to sink in. There's a constant challenge of denial in our life, and we don't appreciate the deep goodness of God until we move beyond denial. And so here we see in this passage, when someone's cheerful, let them sing praise. And what that praise does, when we say it out loud, it sinks in. I can't tell you how many times in my life that I've turned to Judy and said, isn't it amazing this thing with our kids? Or isn't it amazing this thing with our church? Why do I say it to Judy? There's something about saying it out loud with Judy, letting it sink in with her and me, that deepens, widens the appreciation and the cheerfulness and the joy that we share. I talked with a gentleman today on the phone and we were chatting about what sports are like now in this COVID moment with no fans in the this last Sunday, there were no fans watching the Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson golf tournament. And perhaps baseball will be started up again, but there'll be no fans. And there's going to be something missing. The play is good, but the responsiveness, the sharing of the joy in a stadium is something that's contagious and deepening to our faith. It's why you text friends when things go well. It's why on Facebook people show these videos and things. Did you hear about this? Do you know about this? Because a cheerful, joyful, glad tiding that's shared gives us and deepens us in a joyful responsiveness to God. And this gentleman I talked to today said, actually, uh, this is why worship, praise and worship, is a team sport. That's a great phrase, isn't it? Worship is a team sport. It's, it's We gather together on Sundays and other times when we share the goodness of God. It multiplies as we do it in community. And we're so thankful for that reality. So we thank, are thankful to the Lord. Verse 13 goes on. Verse 14 says, is anyone among you sick? So think of the three situations, suffering, cheerful, now sickness. And if we think about the original context of James, we realize that sickness is a much greater part of the ancient world. Again, it's a great part of our world. We live often in denial about it. But, but the reality is sickness was a real part. There were no antibiotics. There were no regular checkups from doctors. There were no kinds of health care that we have that prevents sickness. So people were sick regularly. Loved ones got sick early and often. And so we recognize that God was faithful back then, but people faced sickness. And when they did, they didn't have hospitals, emergency rooms, doctors, all kinds of medications that we have that are gifts of God. But God, in his community, sustained them. And so that's why this passage says, Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. The church has always been involved in the medical care of God's people. It was true in the Old Testament. The people of God in the Old Testament looked to God and to one another to support and enable them to bring healing and care in their sicknesses. Again, there are a number of situations with this. So, so I want to I pause here and just say this. Sickness is a part of life. In the Old and New Testament, it was a little less professional and a little more personal and interpersonal. And so that brings us to this whole question of sickness. And as we talk about praying, then all of a sudden we have the faith of the one who prays, restores them. And then we have this mention of sin and forgiveness. And so this brings us to a whole host of questions that have been discussed and, and discerned by the church for many, many, many years. And so what are we what do we make of this? So let me just kind of in my typical way, wind my way around what the Bible says. And so, and I'll come back to apply it to this passage. Big picture. Sickness was not part of the original plan of God's creation. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created a world that was full of only goodness. It wasn't, didn't have any brokenness. And so there were no sicknesses in the Garden of Eden until Genesis 1 and 2, until Genesis 3. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, when they broke away from the giver and provider of life, well, they broke down. They broke down so that they would they sinned, would lead to suffering, it would lead to sickness, it would lead to death. So we recognize the source. The source of sickness is ultimately a fallen, broken world. It's the devil himself is the prince of this world, so he's in one sense involved in our bodies because they're fallen and now broken. And so sin and sickness will be part. Now, right away, this, this leads us to where many groups start saying, well, your personal sin 
that is the cause of your sickness. It's interesting. That's not just something that, that people hear in the Christian world, but I'm going to suggest it all across religions around the world. If you believe in Islam, Allah, Allah punishes you for your sin. If you sin, and the reason you're suffering, the reason you have the sickness, is because you've done something in this life. Hmm. Hinduism, and even Buddhism, there's this connected idea that maybe in Hinduism, no, it's not because of something you've done in this life, but it's something you've done in a previous life. So that's how we understand suffering. But the Bible is a little more nuanced than that. There are times when our sins do lead our recklessness, our disobedience does lead to a broken sickness of sorts. Uh, we see that. There are times in the Bible where because of people's sinful behavior, they've fallen into sickness. Um, this is, is well within God's sovereign purpose, and it happens. Now, again, it's because we're in a fallen world, but that happens. But as a result, many in the New Testament began to feel like, and even the Old Testament, Begin to feel like if you're sick, it must be because you sin. And the Bible very clearly, back in the right near the beginning, and Job has this long book, 42 chapters, that begin to talk about the fact that Job is sick and is suffering, not because he sinned, but because God permitted the devil to bring this sin and this sickness and the suffering into his life. We recognize in a mysterious and beautiful way God is superintending and permitting this kind of reality into our life. He has a sovereign purpose in it, and we'll see in a moment what that is. But I want to suggest to you that it's not, and Book of Job tells us, it's not because Job sinned and therefore he suffered. And this was the mistake that Job's three friends made. They had to say, Job, confess your sin. And Job kept saying, I, I really haven't done anything consciously. Of course, he was a sinner, but he hadn't done anything consciously. So we want to keep that in mind, that sin is a result of a broken and fallen world of which we are a part. But we shouldn't look at our own sickness or other people's sickness first and foremost as evidence of what we did wrong. In John chapter 9, the disciples saw a blind man and they asked Jesus, was it his sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be blind? Jesus says, neither. Jesus says, not because of the sickness, the sin in their own personal sin. So do you see the distinction? Sickness is a result of the corporate fallen sin of this world, but it's not always, it's not always a result. I sometimes get cancer. Somebody sometimes gets a disease. It's because of a broken world. It's not because of a personal sin. And of course, the last one I'd give you is 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul, not because of a sin, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul is given a thorn in the flesh, some kind of affliction. It's not because of Paul's sin. It's because of God's greater purpose through that sickness. This is a great comfort. We don't have to feel shame or guilt over the sicknesses we have. Many cultures and societies shun their sick because they feel a personal guilt and shame. The Bible says and this is why Christians lean in. And this is why the church and healing, I don't know if you know this, but the early church and then the later as we move through the medieval, the early in the medieval churches, many of those places, well, reached out with the gospel when people got sick they cared for them. And ultimately, hospitals were oftentimes part of the very churches. Uh, the cathedrals where the bishops were located oftentimes had a hospital connected. And that's no coincidence that all of a sudden, as we move through the 1800s and the 1900s, there's a St. Luke's Presbyterian church. There's church, but there's a St. Luke's Presbyterian hospital and a St. John's Catholic hospital. That's a long history of the church being involved in healing in medical, in prayerful care of people. Missouri Baptist Hospital. You get the idea. That's not a coincidence. That's not a marketing ploy. That's a historical reality. And so when the church is coming together to pray for people, um, it's an interesting connection that we don't want to lose. Now, as we look at the gospel, we see that in the Old Testament, God in Psalm 103 says, we praise the Lord because he heals all our diseases. In Isaiah 53, it says, by Christ's wounds, we are healed. And Again, the Gospels show us that Jesus heals people, not only in the words he speaks to their souls, but the words he speaks to their bodies. And so there's this glorious kind of hope that beacons in Jesus that not only will our sins be forgiven, but also our bodies will be restored. Now, as a result of this, you know what has happened. There are some denominations that have 
just jumped upon that idea that God heals and made it the focal point, that physical healing has become the focal point, the focal point of their whole ministry. Now, I'm going to suggest this passage tells us that praying for physical healing is proper. It's good and it's right, but it really isn't the focal point. One, I would just say James chapter 5. It's not in the first, second, third, fourth chapters of James. It doesn't seem to be in Paul's letters, the number one, two, three, fourth thing he mentions. It's it's in the life of the church. Paul says, pray for Epaphroditus. He says, pray for healing. Timothy, take steps and pray that you can be healed in your stomach ailment. But the reality is that there is this beautiful picture in the gospel that Christ heals our bodies and our souls. And in the gospel of Matthew, you read the first verses, Jesus heals a paralytic. Now that's a tremendous affliction. But Jesus connects it in a powerful way. In Matthew chapter 9, he says this. He says, when he heals the paralytic, he says, rise up and walk. And then he says, well, wait a minute. The Pharisees who are watching kind of are skeptical. He says, let me ask you, which is harder, to say your sins are forgiven or to say you rise up and walk? And of course, the Pharisees got the idea. Physical healings had happened before, but no one except God could actually forgive sins. And Jesus then says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. I tell him, rise up and walk. And so we learn in this passage, and among other teachings of the New Testament, that physical healings of the Gospels are actually windows into the work of God in two ways. They are evidence that Jesus Christ is the true one and only Son of Man who heals soul and body. And it gives us hope that the soul's restoration, the forgiveness of sins we experience immediately on trusting Christ, will be matched by the bodily restoration that will happen little by little in our life, but ultimately, ultimately, in the new heavens and new earth when Jesus comes again. And we have this glorious restoration when we're raised to life, body, and soul. So that, that gets us right there. Have I gone around and around with you? But let me just review now. Christ brings ultimate eternal healing. What this means is that as you're trusting Christ, your soul is completely forgiven. It's raised up. It's cleansed. It is completely hidden with Jesus. You are no longer under condemnation. You're free to live a powerful and free life. And your body, your body has been given the great blessing of the Holy Spirit within it, but it still remains broken and it decays. The outward man decays. So I want you to think about this. Lazarus he was raised from the dead, but he died a few years or many years later. The people in the Gospels were raised miraculously, supernaturally by Jesus, but they all died. It is not Jesus' purpose. It is not Jesus' purpose to physically resurrect us at this moment when we trust in Christ. That's not his purpose. The purpose of his healings is to give us hope and point us to the ultimate restoration in the gospel and in our lives. And so what this means is we're going to come to Jesus again and again. And when we die, we're given over to glory. Our spirit is connected to Judy, and Jesus, excuse me, to Jesus. And then at the second coming, when he comes, our bodies will be raised and joined together with our souls where we experience perfect unity and glory, perfection, healing, restoration. Revelation 21 verse 4 says, there'll be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. What a great thing it'll be in the new heavens and new earth. And so what this means is that we should look to Christ as the healer of all our diseases. Yep. And how many times, I want you to think about this. I often haven't. Jesus has healed you countless times. Every infection that comes into your body is potentially fatal. We're realizing that more and more in this COVID moment, that this simple little virus all of a sudden creates a chain reaction that literally could kill us. That kind of reality happened and has happened all the time to you. And by the grace and mercy of God, Jesus has healed you, restored you, kept you alive all these years. So we should give thanks to God and celebrate that. But recognize that while the outer man, we still will be broken down, we still will get sick, our soul is intact and secure, and that we look forward to the one day when Jesus will raise us up. And so now we come to this verse, and it says, those who are really going through struggles and suffering and sickness, 
they have an opportunity to look for to God for healing. And so the church comes together and people go ahead and they pray. Now notice here, it talks about the elders praying. The elders are the ones who really bring the word of God, the word of God, and now they bring the healing of God. The elders are the authoritative leaders of God, and they pray in a circle perhaps around a sick person. Notice the initiative for this is from the sick person. They ask, they request. The elders come to the home, they pray. They notice they anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. Within CPC, we do this. We on our, I would say, as many as six, seven, eight times a year. The number goes up and down depending on the year. People who fear have great afflictions, great pain, serious illness, sometimes depression, sometimes struggles. We've anointed them. Oftentimes we do it in the room right next to the worship area on a Sunday morning. We gather together and we sing songs of praise and healing. And then we lay hands and we anoint the person with oil. The oil is put upon them. Sometimes people put it on the hand and on the forehead. Doesn't seem to be a prescription here that's required. The question is for many, what is the oil? Well, historically, the interpretation has been twofold. In the Old Testament, the New Testament, oil is sometimes a medicinal product. When the Good Samaritan bound up the wounded man, he anointed him with oil. It is probably very, and we have salves and ointments that we use to heal people when they're sick, and it could be a medicinal item. Others suggest that the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, an anointing of sorts. I, I tend, in my reading, to look toward the second interpretation, that this is a, a portrait of the Holy Spirit who has restored our soul, restoring the body. But the point seems to be more importantly than the oil, that it's done in the name of the Lord, that we trust Jesus to heal. And it says that as we pray in faith, that as trusting in God, we'll, we'll see the one who is sick raised up. But notice there's also this idea that the person who's sick might only not only be physically raised up, but perhaps, perhaps there is a greater need of physical as well as, I mean, excuse me, spiritual as well as physical restoration. And so, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And so here James moves in this moment from sickness to spiritual soundness. And I want to suggest to us that this often happens in our lives. When you are struggling with sickness, it's a great opportunity for us to just renew and recommit ourselves to God, not because we're guilty or ashamed because of sickness, but because we realize God is near to us and he becomes so special and dear to us in that moment. And it's an opportunity for us to experience the forgiveness and restoration of God, perhaps as he raises us up. So oftentimes he does. But even as he doesn't, to look to the time he will ultimately raise us up. We don't believe the Bible teaches here that every prayer, every prayer will lead to physical healing. And I think this is a misreading of the New Testament, a misreading. The Gospels are filled with healings, but I want to suggest that Paul in Corinthians 12 and other places in the New Testament tell us there are times where God doesn't, he does not, always say yes to healing on this earth. Oh, he ultimately says yes in the new heavens and new earth. So that God always heals his people. But the timing of it may be many years from now, or it may be in a time when he takes us to be with him. So I think it's important for us not to use prayer as a lever to manipulate God, but to use prayer as an opportunity to open ourselves up to the purpose of God. And then we trust him in faith, the one who is sick can be restored and we celebrate that and if he has committed sins the grace of God flows and he experiences forgiveness verse 16 goes on then and says therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that he might not it might not rain and for three days and six months it did not rain then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So here we have the great encouragement. But I'm going to go on just a little more and read this last section, because I want to tie this together in a way that may be a little surprising. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wanderings will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You see, it's an interesting thing. As we look at this passage, it's an interesting thing as we recognize 
that God is interested in not only restoring us individually, right, but also corporately. And I think the last passages, verse 16 and onward, are about a community that looks to God in our time of need, suffering, cheerfulness, sickness, but also, also in our times of brokenness. This is a real challenge and opportunity for us to think about what kind of church God wants us to be. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There are some more traditional churches that, that teach that this is something that you should do with a priest. But notice, in verse 16 is saying, we're to confess our sins to one another. Oh, it's fine to talk to a pastor about your needs spiritually, but the Bible has the dream and the design for the church to be a redemptively restorative fellowship. We're to, Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 1 says that if someone's caught in sin, we're to restore them. So confessing our sins one to another, this means we need to have an openness in our services as we confess our sins on Sunday morning. But I think even more appropriately in Bible studies and lifelines in accountability groups and discipleship groups, that this is a practice. We're confessing our sins to one another and we're praying for one another. Notice, we're not condemning one another. We're not judging one another. What a contrast this is to the rest of the book. Do you notice? We're praying for one another so that we all may be healed, experience the forgiveness and be brought closer together. Now, right away, then it shifts to this prayer of a righteous man has great power. And again, Elijah is this prophet. And if you think about what Elijah was doing, was he was trying to restore Israel to walk with God. And if you think of the whole book of James now for a moment, I think what the author of James has been trying to do is to take a church that is double-minded. Do you remember that? Two-souled, divided in their allegiance, and say, God wants to, through affliction, through your faith being given over in mercy and action, through taming your tongue and using wisdom, through leaning into God and trusting him, walking in humility, and now coming to him in our suffering, our sickness, and our cheerfulness. God wants to restore us as a whole community. And the prayers of God's people have the power to do that. And Elijah was doing that very thing in a divided country. There were those who were serving Baal. There were those who were seeing false gods. And Elijah prayed that God would do what he would do. Notice Elijah's prayer was for discipline. Don't let it rain. Then blessing. Let it rain. Isn't that amazing? God calls for us to pray, sometimes for us to be convicted and challenged, other times to be nurtured and blessed. In either case, the idea is for us to, well, Revelation 3, to be zealous and therefore repent. Or, as Romans 2 says, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. God is in the process, as we pray, of to restore us. And the prayer of the righteousness man has the great power, not only to see people forgiven sickness, not only to see people come to Christ, but a whole church community restored in the presence of God. And this is exactly what Elijah witnessed in his day in the face of great opposition from Ahab and Jezebel. The people of God saw God's victory in bringing them together. And those who were wandering were brought back. And this is the purpose of the prophet. So what this means for us is that we should align our hearts with God's purpose. John 14, John 15, 1 John 5 tell us that prayer given in the name of Christ, according to the words of Christ, according to the will of God, those are the prayers that God answers. And that's why a righteous man in his prayer has great power. Not because righteous men have power to manipulate or bribe God. No, no, no. Righteous people see things from God's perspective. They recognize that God wants to bless in this way, to discipline in this way, to give, to take, to do. And as we align ourselves with God's purposes, we see the will of God moving forward in our lives. And so this is why the Lord's Prayer says, and this teaches us how to pray as righteous people, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven as earth as it is in heaven. Do you get it? The idea is we align ourselves with God's will. Then we begin to ask for what we need, right? We ask the Lord, give us this day our daily bread. 
Forgive us our sins. Lead us not into... So you see that God is the one that's restoring us and he does it by us focusing upon him and praying to him, aligning our prayers with his kingdom and his will. And as we pray in that manner, we begin to see amazing things happen in our lives, in our church's lives, in our community. It's truly remarkable. And that's why the passage then goes on and says, my brothers, if anyone wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. How beautiful is this? And the book of James has been struggling with this legalistic kind of community, but it's now suggesting that the church has grown in their endurance, in their wisdom, in their dependence upon God, so much so that they're not only a pe people who are walking with God, but they're restoring others who aren't walking with God, those who are struggling, those who have wandered from the faith. Think about what this means. The traditional legalistic church does two things in ways that are not helpful. Two things. They run people off. If you're not living up to the standards, they run you off. And then the second thing they do is they write people off. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. They run people off and they write people off. And so this is a dangerous thing. This passage is saying if we're going to be a church that that loves God and loves our neighbor. We're going to be the kind of church that is able to walk with him humbly, depending upon him, but is also restoring others who others have written off, who others think will never come back. What a great privilege I've seen, not only in the church here, but in the churches I've previously served, to see those who've wandered away, those who young people who really had disinterest in the faith, come back. And God is such a beautiful God in his generosity. That's why the prodigal son story is a story written to that gospel community that Jesus is trying to convey them that those who remain in the body, that elder brother need the gospel, but those who've wandered off, they have hope in the gospel if they but turn and come back. And so the passage ends with this sinner wanders, but he can return. And the many, many, many sins, just like the many, many sins of those who've remained, can be forgiven restoration is possible. And so we recognize that in the disciples who deserted Christ, in Peter who denied Christ, in Paul who persecuted the church, in John Mark who seemed to desert Paul and Barnabas and then was restored later, the gospel seems to be full as is church history of those who've turned from God and then by God's grace turned back. So I hope today as you've seen this study you realize that the book of James in one sense, started out with a lot of struggle. And in the midst of that struggle, God's grace is showing itself to be evident where the people of God are encouraged and by God's grace able to begin to walk faithfully, walk in wisdom, walk in humility, and now walk in a way that is truly missional. They're actually a church that's now restoring and renewing people who are struggling. I hope that's what CPC is becoming. I'm so thankful for the way God has has given us the opportunity to respond to God's redemption. As we look at the whole book together, I hope it's been a help to you. And I hope that as we wrap up this study, that you really will go back and think about how trials are growing you, how your faith can be active, especially helping those in need. If the wisdom that you have, the knowledge that you have is something that also lifts others up, not looks down on them. And I hope that indeed you recognize that you're to have one passion and one commitment, not divided at all, but totally allegiant to God. And then as you walk in humility, you're part of a community that actually helps those who struggle and helps those who've wandered off. And you're open to see God's restoring grace as something you need every day and something others can begin to understand even today. So I hope that indeed this has been a helpful time. And I want to close in prayer for not only this study, but for our whole book of James. Lord, I thank you for this group. And I pray that as we finish this story and the book of James, we just would let it soak into us and let it flow through us. We thank you for its inspired message coming from your Holy Spirit. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would put it to work in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We'll see you next week with Weekly Wisdom. We'll be looking at a new topic together. Thank you. God bless.